Beginning with the 13th Yajna in Delhi in October 1955, Swamiji started unraveling the hidden gems of wisdom in the Bhagavad Gita. His talks on this scripture were so exquisite that at times he appeared as Lord Krishna himself on stage to the audience. Some saw the apparition of sage Vyasa. When devotees told Swamiji about this, he would quickly dismiss it as unimportant. You are aiming for the truth beyond all forms. Go there, he would say. At that yajna in Delhi, Swamiji also began a morning class on the text Viveka Chudamani, or the crown jewel of discrimination. Swamiji was inspired to put his commentary in a book form for both these scriptures so that they could reach a larger audience. Swamiji, with the help of books and his notes, began to dictate a verse-by-verse -verse commentary of these books. They worked through many nights and months. Swami Shivananda himself had volunteered the use of the translations from his publication of the Gita, and this saved Swami Chinmayananda significant hours of work. Also, about this time, Swamiji began the use of what he referred to as the Om chart as a visual aid which soon became famous as the BMI chart to all his devotees. Finally, on Deepavali in 1957, Swamiji announced that the Gita commentary, 2085 pages of manuscript, was complete a truly monumental achievement from which millions have and continue to benefit. By now, Swamiji had written an astounding 59 books, many of them commentaries on the Upanishads and other scriptural texts. An organization was needed to manage, print and publish these books for the benefit of all. And hence, the Chinmaya Publication Trust was formed in 1961 as the basis for the Books and Publications Division. And thanks to this division, millions of us have access to these texts at various centers throughout the world. Since the spring of 1951, as we have seen, Swami Chinmayananda was no longer a quote-unquote full-time student of Swami Tapovanam. But each year, in the summer months, he would return to the Himalayas, and he always made it a point to first visit Swami Shivananda at Rishikesh, and then to spend time with his guru, Swami Tapovanam. The elderly Swami was no longer able to go on strenuous hikes, and had now begun to live a quiet life. He had read Chinmaya's discourses on the Upanishads, printed in the Yajna Prasad that he regularly received. He was very pleased. Taking Vedanta to the hearts of the people was the highest service one can do for his fellow man, he said. When Chinmaya arrived, the guru and disciple would sit out on the veranda of Swami Tapovan's Kutiya, engrossed in discussions. By the peals of laughter and the looks on their faces, Swami Govindagiri and others could tell that the two were really enjoying each other's company. He would observe, From that time on, Swami Tapovanam always treated Swami Chinmayananda as a friend, no longer a student. And this meant that Chinmaya had the total blessings of his Guru, which could only come from his own merit. In the year 1956, Swami Chinmayananda received word that Swami Tapovanam had fallen ill. He immediately took a month off from his extremely busy yajna schedule to be with his Guru. And later that year, Swami Tapovan's health turned much worse. Swamiji would travel again to Uttarkashi to be with his Guru. He later wrote of that last meeting. During my last visit to Tapovan Kutir in 1956, I broke down suddenly and burst into tears. Swamiji saw me and said softly, 
Chinmaya, it is easy to learn Vedanta, easier to preach Vedanta, but hard indeed to live the knowledge. When we are born, death is born with us. The Lord gave me so long an opportunity to live and experience. Now he who was waiting so long is coming to meet me. And you say, I must now run to escape him? How? Here quietly I have lived. Now cannot I quietly die, hearing the eternal music of my mother Ganga? Don't weep. You go and continue the work. Come. During my last visit, December 5th and 6th, 1956, I was rather crestfallen to see him in the physical condition he was in. By then, he had for days almost stopped taking food, and he had grown emaciated to less than one-eighth of his normal size. It was difficult for him even to stand up without the help and support of others, and yet he would insist that he must come to his usual seat on the veranda as ever before and stay there from 6 a.m. until the late hour of 10 p.m. Seeing him in this condition, an old devotee of his procured some pillows and a cushion. The vehemence with which he protested against such pleasures given to the body, even in that condition, was an education in itself. However, more to satisfy the old saint from Ahmedabad than to make himself comfortable, he allowed those things around him. But the next day, it was more painful for me to see that he had left the support of even the bare wall and was trying to sit upright, lest his body might learn to enjoy the pillow. I have already left this body. There is nothing in it to regret were the words that he said to me with a smile, and the sparkle in his eyes at the time was, to say the least, rather mischievous. My reaction to these words was rather tragic. Looking into my brimming eyes, he expressed his regret. So, this is the Vedanta that you have studied from me? What is strange in death? Death is only one of the experiences which the Atma illumines. We are not that dying stuff, we are the Self. It was their last meeting. Swami Tapovan's condition would deteriorate. On January 16th, 1957, in the Brahma Muhurtam, around 5 a.m., Swami Tapovanam quietly left the mortal face of the earth into the realm of the beyond. The love between a guru and his student is unlike any other. It is a divine love of purity. Swamiji came to terms with the greatest loss in his life by remaining in solitude for days in Rishikesh. Swami Tapovanam was the spirit of Vedanta itself, and it was as if this spirit had now entered the heart of a newly blossoming organization, the Chinmaya Mission. <laughs> 